Hello and welcome to Psychology 303, the Analysis of Everyday Behavior. This is Dr. Williams and uh, this is the first in a series of uh, lectures over Chapter 1. Uh, this is Lecture 1A and the topic for all of these lectures is the Introduction to Behavior Analysis. So let me begin by defining what behavior analysis is. Applied Behavior Analysis, or ABA as we'll be calling it, is the science of studying, controlling, and predicting behavior. It's also called behavior modification. Behavior analysts reject the use of uh, hypothetical constructs and uh, theoretical relationships, and basically they focus on observable relationships between behavior and the environment by functionally assessing the relationship between target behaviors and the environment, the methods of applied behavior analysis can then be used to change that behavior. So just as a general overview, applied behavior analysis is what we have for a long time called behavior modification, and it has several goals. The goals of ABA are, first of all, as intervention specialists, which many of you will go on to become, our first and primary goal is to help people improve their lives through behavior change. We look to influence future probabilities uh, of certain behaviors. So we want to increase the odds of some behaviors or increase the frequency of those behaviors and decrease other behaviors. And to do so, we manipulate environmental variables rather than using techniques such as drugs or surgery or um, uh, more invasive uh, kinds of interventions. We just rely on changes in the environment. And so our primary target is behavior. So what exactly is behavior? Well, behavior is what people do. It's our speech, it's our actions, it's our reactions, um, but it's not labels. We don't use uh, labels like whether you're introverted or extroverted because that's just a label of your behavior. So we rely on specifically the behaviors that we see. Behavior is often multidimensional and in way it's multidimensional in ways that we can measure. So, for example, we can measure the frequency of a behavior, or how long a behavior lasts, or how intense is that behavior, or how strong or big is that behavior, like the difference between talking and shouting. Behavior can be observed, it can be described, and we can record it. Now, uh, it can be overt, in other words, I can observe your behavior and see it because it's on the outside. But behavior can also be covert. It includes behaviors like thinking and reasoning and language. And those behaviors, although they're difficult to measure, are not impossible to measure. And so we're talking about both external or overt and internal behaviors that are covert. These behaviors have a direct impact on our environment. Our behaviors have consequences. And so those consequences are going to be important in how we go about treating or changing or modifying behavior. Behavior is lawful. Behavior is systematically influenced by uh, the principles of behavior that have been studied for almost 100 years. And so uh, our, it's important to remember that our real goal here is to help people change their behavior, overt or covert, using the basic principles of behavior. Now, how do I know a behavior when I see one? Well, an overt or covert action on the part of an organism is really what we're looking at. We're talking about muscular behavior. We might even be talking about things like glandular behavior or neuroelectrical activity. So uh, a really good test is something that we call the dead man's test. Okay, so the dead man's test basically has you select a behavior and then you ask yourself, could a dead man do it? If a dead man can do it, it probably isn't behavior. So for example, laying down 
is not necessarily, uh, pardon me, let me back up. Being reclined or laying down is probably, a dead man can do it, and so it's not really a behavior. But the verb laying down, a dead man can't do. And so therefore, in that sense, the sense of laying down being a verb, something that you do, is a behavior. So if a dead man can do it, it's probably not behavior. But if a dead man can't do it, it probably is behavior. So we can take examples like walking, eating, singing, barking, dancing, playing poker, cheating on your homework, uh, throwing spit wads, um, learning the alphabet, getting to time on work, uh, getting to work on time, sorry, uh, learning ASL. Uh, all of these things are behaviors. But things like sitting, if you're describing what they're doing, a dead man can sit. If you're talking about the act of sitting down, I'm going to sit down, then it would be a behavior. So you can always ask yourself, is it a behavior or not? So what about things like thinking? Can a dead man do it? Nope. So it's a behavior. What about uh, feeling? Dead men don't do it. So feeling is a behavior. It's a response. Uh, reasoning. Dead men don't do it, so it's a behavior. So it doesn't matter if it's internal or external, overt or covert, uh, as long as it's an action that someone does, then it's a behavior. And so you can always ask yourself when you look at something, is that really a behavior? And if so, uh, you can, and to find out, you can use the dead man's test. Okay, so uh, what about thinking? Well, if a dead man can't do it, it must be behavior. And thinking and reasoning and private behaviors uh, mean that at some point, behavioral psychologists have to account for these private behaviors, like thinking and reasoning and feeling. Um, currently, we often refer to those behaviors as sub-vocal speech. It's language that goes on in our head. Some of these behaviors are not completely ready for empirical study because we can't observe them overtly. We can't actually go in and look at them. Um, but people can self-report on private activities. They can write down what they're thinking. They can report what they're thinking. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be true or false or accurate or not, but what they're thinking they can keep track of. And when we talk about self-management, we'll talk about uh, uh, observing your own behavior. Now, it's important to point out that uh, so having some behaviors like thinking and reasoning are a little bit harder to study, but as they become more accessible with our neuroscience, our ability to look inside the head and see thinking happening or reasoning happening, then behavioral psychology is sort of um, charged with accounting for those behaviors and why they increase or decrease or why they occur frequently or infrequently. So far, those behaviors that we've studied internally, those private behaviors or covert behaviors, have not uh, shown themselves to be any different than observable behaviors. They follow the same basic behavior principles. So for those behaviors that we've been able to go in and observe and measure, uh, behavioral principles do seem to apply. Let me move my little cursor here. Okay, so the target behavior, that's a word I'm going to be using a lot. I'm going to talk about the target behavior. And this is typically the behavior that, as an intervention specialist, I'm interested in. So I will specify that I want, I'm stead, the target behavior is uh, uh, homework completion or verbal behavior or um, aggression. And usually it's the behavior that we want to modify. So we can modify it in certain ways, like how frequently it happens, what the duration is, what its intensity is. And our goal might be to increase it. So those behaviors for which there's a deficit, there's not enough of the behavior, we may want to increase it. Uh, there may, when the behavior is excessive, we may want to decrease it. And there's also the possibility that we don't just want the behavior to decrease, but we want it to go away altogether. We want to extinguish that behavior completely. Or 
it might be that there's certain behaviors that we worry will change along with other behaviors. So if I change your, um, uh, let's see, if I change your uh, participation behavior, we might also see uh, an increase in um, irrelevant uh, conversation. And so I might want to maintain irrelevant conversation to a minimum while increasing relevant conversation in class. So that might be an example. So let's see here. So we have two main emphases. First of all, we want to analyze the behavior. We really want to identify the relationship that exists between the environment and the behavior before we intervene. We want to really understand what's causing or maintaining the behavior. And we know that for the book, for the, for the most part, causes lie in the environment. So what are the environmental situations that allow this behavior to occur or prevent a behavior we want from occurring? Um, and what we're identifying are causes and effects. So the causes are in the environment, the effects are the behaviors or the rate of behaviors that we engage in. So we really want to understand the nature of the behavior problem before we intervene. And then we want to do modification. We want to develop and implement procedures that are going to help change that behavior for the better for the individual. Now the beauty of this approach is number one, it's very optimistic. Success depends really on tailor making treatments that fit specific behaviors in certain environments. And we never look at a client or a student or an individual as being problematic. It's the behavior that's problematic. And so we rarely, uh, if our intervention doesn't succeed, it usually means that we've described it incorrectly or that we understand it incorrectly. And so we go back and revisit our analysis. And so the, the, the really nice thing about it being so optimistic is that we believe that we can make behavior change pretty much under any circumstances. And if we're failing, the, the problem is with how we're doing it, not with the individual. Now, it's also true that applied behavior analysis is very individualized. It treats every client as an individual. There's no control group. There's no experimental group. We look at behavior before we implement an intervention, and then we implement our treatment plan and look at how behavior changes relative to where it was before. You probably have taken research methods and or uh, intro psych, one of the two, and you probably remember uh, the discussion about ABA reversal designs. And so really, we never compare one individual to another. We get all of our data and all of our evidence by going back and forth between uh, baseline and treatment within a single individual. So it's important at this point to point out that this method is an approved method uh, and an appropriate method within the scientific framework. We still use independent and dependent variables. We still gather large amounts of data. Uh, and we, we do seek um, external validity by repeating the study within the individual and often across individuals. So remember that we don't need necessarily need a lot of people in an experiment. What we really need is a lot of data because it's the data that goes into the, the statistics. And if I, if I were to um, gather one data point from 100 people, I could also gather 50 data points from two people and I would still have the same amount of data. So it's important to remember that this approach, the single subject design and applied behavior analysis approach, is considered uh, appropriate science. And the application of uh, applied behavior analysis relies both on basic science, basic laboratory-based science, and applied research out in the world. It does both. It goes back and forth between the two. Scientific evidence provides the justification for going out into the world and using an intervention with a real person. 
Um, and we typically are looking to correctly identify the causal relationship between behavior and environmental factors. Finally, I've sort of touched on this, but I want to point out that applied behavior analysis is very valid. It's scientifically valid and it is socially valid. Uh, it relies on actual replication. It doesn't rely on probabilistic statistics. It relies on actual replication of effects in order to demonstrate that our treatment works and in order to build a case for external validity. So these are important little pieces to remember and I'll revisit them when we, uh, as we go through the quarter. But they're important to know from the very beginning. Now, what exactly are you going to learn in Psych 303? Well, first of all, we're going to get a pretty good introduction to behavior analysis. We're going to learn about behavior management principles and the techniques, how you use them. We're going to learn about techniques for evaluating and assessing problem behaviors. We're going to look at research-based techniques and intervention for modifying problem behaviors. We're going to learn about methods that allow us to help others help themselves. So we're going to learn how to teach people to do self-management. And finally, we're going to look at applications that can be implemented at the individual level, at the group level, or even at the community level that will improve the lives of other people. So uh, this class is going to be very um, tailored to actual intervention. And I hope that makes this class unique for you. Well, that's it for this chapter. Uh, it's only, I want to try to keep these lectures short. And so uh, I'll see you during lecture 1B. Have a good day.